Thank you for joining our May Natural Resources Investor webinar. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Donald Leggett, Head of Investor Relations, and I'm your host for this evening. We're delighted to have four fabulous companies speaking tonight. We have Paul Bay from Touchstone Exploration, Eric Zurin and Luke Leslie uh, from Shanta Gold. We welcome back David Archer from Savannah Resources, and we introduce Ben Turney from, from Kavango Resources. Each of our companies gets roughly 18 minutes to present their investment case, and then we take live questions from the audience for a further 10. Uh, please use the Q&A bo uh, button at the bottom of the screen, not chat, as that's disabled. Do keep the questions short and understandable, please, and do give me your name so I can say thank you to you. We generally get lots of questions and the early ones get answered. As you probably know, our chat boards are one of the best loved parts of the lec.co.uk website and each UK listed company has their own page there with company data. So please leave any messages uh, there and check out the free company stats available during the evening. Our first company this evening is Touchstone Exploration, the AIM listed Canadian oil and gas exploration company. Uh, TXP are now the largest onshore producer in Trinidad with a stable base of 250 legacy producing oil wells in the Southwest Peninsula. And with the production and exploration focused firmly on the Ortoir block in the east, where Coho, Cascadura 1 and Cascadura Deep have produced extended flow tests of around 11,600 barrels of oil equivalent uh, per day between them. Uh, Touchstone therefore has a, a, a sizable market cap of around 202 million currently. And London Southeast, we, I are delighted uh, to welcome Paul Bay, Touchstone President and CEO. Over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Donald. Really appreciate the, uh, the introduction. And I think I'm gonna get Mike to pull up the presentation here. Um, what I'd like to do in the, uh, in the presentation today is walk you through a little bit of what's happened. And, and we put out an RNS this morning, which I think gave a pretty good uh, operational update. But what I'd really like to do today is uh, talk about what's gonna happen in the latter half of this year and into next year. Um, as we bring these, these wells on production as we move forward. So that's, um, that's going to be the, the big part of what we do. On, the, on this cover shot uh, that you see here, this is actually um, gives you an idea of the kind of area that we're operating in. This is one of the most recent wells that we drilled. And you can see that it's in a, it's in a pretty jungled area within Trinidad. Um, but by the same token, it's very close to infrastructure. And I'll show you that on the map. So it's a pretty typical oil and gas operation and what we see. The thing that we've really been focusing on or, or attempting to focusing on are sort of four different pillars that we work on within the organization. And, and the first one is really this concept of being opportunity rich. And I, I think when you look at where Trinidad is located, where our specific lands are located, it, it really is a, a hydrocarbon charge basin, um, very, very big reserves. And uh, we'll, we'll show you a little bit of the geology and then we'll show you some of the potential of the wells. And, Donald and I were chatting earlier that, you know, one of the challenges we have is these wells are so large that, um, you know, it kind of sets up a little bit of a roller coaster ride when you do the exploration, um, just because they're so impactful, each one of them individually. So we'll talk about that. And then under, underpinning some of the big exploration, we've got this sort of stable legacy production, um, which currently is producing about 1400 barrels a day. But the nice thing about it is it's, it's high net back oil production. And what that allows us to do is basically pay all the bills out of that base production while we ramp it up. And to give you an example, you know, we're doing 1400 barrels a day now. Come the end of this year, we'll be north of 15, 16,000 BOEs a day. So you'll see a tenfold increase in our production uh, over the course of the next uh, basically nine months. And as far as the drilling inventory goes, and this is, I think, one of the key things of this story is between what we've got on the exploration and the development. Um, you know, we've got a 20 year drilling inventory in Trinidad. So we're going to be there for a long time. And, uh, and this company is just going to continue to grow as we, as we move along. I was also joking. It's kind of an overnight success story that took us about 11 years to put together. So it's, um, it's, you know, as I say, we're going to be here for a long time. The visions and the values, you, we really want to invest in the community. And we really think that we're a leader in a bunch of things we're doing already, but um, there's still room for improvement. We'll touch on those a little. And then quite frankly, is the value creation. We think that you really add value in our business by drilling wells and getting that production on and taking things from being reserves into the production base. And that's starting to be reflected in our, our share price. So 
very excited about that. So just uh, a little bit about what I was talking about, about where Trinidad is located. This is a, uh, you know, a fairly detailed geological map, but, but I think the two big takeaways from this are the big yellow circle that you see there are um, Guyana, Suriname, up off the coast of Venezuela and Trinidad is that yellow star. And actually that yellow star is right where our Oratua block is. And basically what you can see is there's been all sorts of success through here lately. You know, Exxon's big discovery in Guyana um, along there. And we're going to drill a similar prospect to that in 2022. And then you've got that Eastern Venezuelan basin, which is, you know, the richest uh, hydrocarbon basin in the world that extends up past Trinidad. So you really get a, you really see sort of the world-class style of exploration and development opportunities in what we in what we see from a geological point of view. So, you know, if you look more specifically, that yellow star basically sat right over the Oratua block, which you see in that, that mustard yellow color. And that's our exploration acreage. And that's really going to be the, the driver of growth for the company. And, and I'll talk about that in a, in a lot more detail on another map. But at the same time, on the west side of the island um, are, is our development acreage, which is that that historical um, 1,400 barrel a day production. It's been as high as 2,000 barrels a day. Um, we really just haven't focused much on it because both the capital and the manpower has been focused over at Oratua. But, but you know, I, I don't want to underplay these uh, these assets. There's very very large oil in place, and I think the real takeaway is some of the deeper prospects that we're seeing at Oratua. Uh, you're going to see us start to drill some of those over on the west side of the island and specifically at that area that you see there called Kura. Um, there's a couple of really deep opportunities there. So we'll, um, we're just in the midst of renewing those contracts uh, with the government. And when we do that, you'll see a little more of that laid out, but there's definitely a trend all the way through the island and what we see. So let me focus a little bit on Oratua because that's the, the biggest part of the story. So uh, this has been the history and um, you know, it's, it's, I, I think it's fair to say it's been um, a much better than average exploration program, but it has been an exploration program. You know, Coho, uh, a great first step for us, 1900 BOEs a day that should come on stream here, you know, some, sometime soon as we get um, uh, approval to tie into an existing gas plant, uh, we'll have that on well with on within with about 60 days of that notification. Cascadura is just a world-class uh, pool that we discovered. You know, we show the one test on here at 5,400 BOEs a day. It was actually two different tests. That well, if it had, it had bigger pipe in the hole, it could be capable of 10,000 BOEs a day. Chinook, I think clearly a disappointment. It was, uh, you know, we were hoping to look for another Cascadura and, and uh, we ended up in the oil window, which has really presented some challenges for us to produce. And uh, we're going to go up hole and look at some of the development uh, gas in that area. but. You know, it, it, I, I guess that would be that, you know, in the exploration game, you're going to get these as you go along. We then went back and drilled a deeper well at Cascadura, and you can see the results there, uh, 4,200 BOEs a day on extended flow test, and that was, that was in the takeaway today. That, you know, that really is a, a, a fantastic second well, and it, what it's really set up for us is a, a level of confidence now in Cascadura and the block in its entirety. And then the Royston gas prospect, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So that's kind of what we've done. So this gives you a really good map of, of what we've got going on and, and where we're going to go. And I'll, I'll sort of stop on this map for a couple of minutes. The key takeaways here are is the natural gas pipeline that goes right through the middle of that block. Uh, that goes up to the petrochemical business. And basically, that's where all of our gas will come into. And then you see the, uh, the green line that goes uh, the opposite way through the block. That's the heritage oil pipeline. So we can tie in any of our liquids into that. So great, great infrastructure uh, in what we're doing. But let me just kind of give you an idea of what we've got going on right now. Um, right now, if you look over at Coho, that little red line that you see there, uh, that's what we're waiting for final approval from, uh, from the National Gas Company to, to give us the green light to go ahead and, and tie into that plant that you see to the south there. Um, it's going to happen. It's just a question of when it's going to happen. So, um, you know, there's an expression in Trinidad that says, uh, 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 gentle pressure, um, applied forever. And, and that's really what we're doing here is you just got to keep pushing little by little, but that, that will, uh, definitely come on stream. And then when you look over at the Cascadura, um, those two flames that you see there are basically Cascadura and Cascadura deep. 
Um, and those X's that you see are additional drilling locations. And on each one of those drilling pads, we'll see two to four additional locations. So it gives you an idea of how expansive Cascadura is. And now what we see at Cascadura is actually multi-sheets and we've proved that up with Cascadura Deep. So the, you know, this project, um, as was mentioned, the RNS is initially gonna be designed for 90 million cubic feet a day and about 2000 barrels a day of liquids. Um, but it is being designed to expand to 200 million cubic feet a day, and it'll be about, about 5,000 barrels of liquid. So it kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're at on that. That little oil drop you see to the south is the Chinook well. That was uh, a disappointment, but we did get light oil in all three zones that we tested, just not of economic amount. So the seismic clearly shows us we can move up dip to the north, and you see those again, those two locations that we'll be applying for that'll have two to four wells on them. So we're, we're pretty confident with that. And then if you move over to Royston, which is that last, uh, that big black star um, over on the eastern side of the block, that will be the last well of what I'm calling our phase one exploration um, development. And uh, that is by far the biggest prospect that we've drilled so far. Um, you know, it would be, we would see it being up to twice the size of Cascadura. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sizable. The road is now built into Royston. Uh, it needs a final push on it and then we'll be spotting that well in June and hopefully have the results sort of 60 to 90 days after that. So then we enter into phase two of the exploration program, which is really the Kraken well, the Steelhead well and the Bedeen well that you see there. And they're the exact same concept as what we've seen before, um, except that they're a little um, different in some of the reservoirs we're chasing. That Kraken well you know, I talk about Royston being bigger than Cascadura. The Kraken well is bigger than what Royston can potentially be. It's deeper. It's the same type of prospect as what Exxon's drilling offshore in, um, in Guyana. Um, you know, we've, we've tried to make this anomaly go away. We've reprocessed it. We've done all sorts of things. It's a well that's got to be drilled. So we'll get it drilled in 2022. And then Steelhead to the south of that, that Karamat uh, prospect that you see there, it's Kind of interesting. I got a I got an email from one of our shareholders that found a an old letter um, that is the weekly newspaper for Shell employees and their families, and it talks about the well that was originally drilled there in uh, 19 April 10th of 1959, and it says that the well uh, was plugged back because they they were trying to test it and they got stuck in the hole, and after 110 days and four hundred thousand uh, dollars, they decided they had to walk away but the indications from ditch cuttings and electronic logs um, gave them lots of information. So that's the well that we'll actually be twinning and hopefully using some, some more current technology to make sure that we get it done. But, but Shell was excited about it back in 1959 and we're certainly excited about it now. And then when you go over to Gabine, it's, you know, it's another great, great prospect um, and it'll be drilled as part of the program. Then on top of that, we've got all the development drilling that you see. So, so this block now represents uh, partly exploration, partly development, um, you know, uh, clear view to a couple hundred million cubic feet a day of gas, more than that if Royston's successful and just a ton of prospects. So I think a lot of people are kind of stuck that we might be at the end of the Oratwa exploration. I would argue that we're at the very beginning of uh, what's gonna be a, a pretty exciting five-year program. So this is just uh, gives you the Royston prospect. And the reason I put it up here is it kind of gives an idea of, of what we do. So we basically have an old log from 1965. We've got brand new seismic that we've shot. We've got an interpretation. This is what we use. Uh, we go in and we're basically twinning an old well that we think has 700 feet of bypass pay. We're gonna take the well about a thousand feet deeper. And um, our view is pretty simple here is that, that we think that if you can prove hydrocarbon in this, then you set up, you know, four to eight development locations and, you know, up to a TCF of gas uh, just in that prospect alone. So this is kind of how these models come together. So in summary, uh, you know, I think the key, key part for the Oratois block is we've got this great gas contract uh, with the National Gas Company. They'll take all the gas that we deliver to them. They will build the pipelines into our various wells. Um, so our capital cost is really just drilling and, and getting them on stream. The drilling inventory in here is at least 10 years when you look at exploration development. Um, you know, we've got 21 exploration targets now in, in those various blobs that you saw on that map. And uh, as far as local content goes, um, you know, it's, it's been really exciting to get involved with the community there 
And I think once we start to uh, generate some revenue, right now we're just spending money, but when we start to generate some revenue, there's some really exciting things that we're gonna, gonna get involved with in the community. And then the other assets that I don't wanna ignore, but I, I, I think it's important, um, you know, Scott, our CFO has just been negotiating to get a 10 year extension on that. And basically what it is, is it's our base production. We got 10 fields, we got 200 drilling locations. It's big oil in place. We're bringing a new rig into the country uh, later this year that is specifically designed to drill these wells really efficiently, plus being able to go to 15,000 feet at Oratoire. So, you know, we're going to have all the equipment, we're going to have all the technology uh, that we need to uh, improve our drilling, lower our costs, doing all of those things that we want to do. So uh, it's really set up a great opportunity for us. And then, uh, you know, talk a little bit about the visions and values. It's uh, our, our team in Trinidad is, is all local content. Um, you know, it's been really tough not having to be able to get down there in the last 14 months, but quite frankly, the team has just ran things flawlessly. Um, there are some pretty, pretty restrict uh, COVID um, measures in place right now, and the team can, continues to operate, uh, you know, through that and uh, and putting safety before everything else, but it's really impressive to see that that everything is going on and and our involvement in the community I think is above anything that uh, that we've seen. So pretty excited about that as well. I'm looking forward to get back there. It's it's tough to spend an entire winter in Canada when you don't get the opportunity to go to Trinidad at least for a couple of trips. So I uh, just talk about uh, gas supply and consumption, and I I won't get stuck on this for very long, but you know we get asked this a lot. Basically, total demand in Trinidad is 4 BCF a day, and uh, current production is about 2.6 BCF. So I'd like to say we could we could fill that over time. Uh, bottom line is we won't, but I think what it should um, give a lot of comfort to shareholders is that any gas and oil that we find in Trinidad is going to have a market with a high load factor and uh, is going to generate just a ton of cash for us uh, when it gets on stream. Uh, just a little bit about reserve growth. Uh, obviously, 2020 was a, a huge expansion year for us, and we're hoping for the same thing in 2021 with both the results we've seen at Cascadura Teeth and the drilling we've got coming up at Royston. Um, you know, our, our P1 reserves in 2020 were higher than our P3 reserves in 2019, and pretty happy to cross through that 100 million barrel mark um, of P3 reserves independently evaluated. So. I think you know this also goes through to shareholder value and, and underlying asset value. Um, just again, some of the value creation. Uh, you know, we're keeping a really close eye on the balance sheet. We've got 15 million of cash. Probably the biggest question I get right now is with the delays that are happening in Trinidad. Are you going to have to do an equity issue? Uh, Scott, James, and I are focused on one thing, and that's getting everything on production, and we'll push the capital out um, so that we can manage our way through both the the available availability on the uh, credit facility and the cash that we've got on hand. Um, we'll get through to that and get production on and then we can fund the rest of the program and ramp it up uh, out of the cash flow. So I don't know how to give anybody any more comfort on that than to just tell them, you know, if you look at the numbers, um, we're, we're really well funded to get through to this program. So that's, uh, I won't go through all of these. I, I, I think the real takeaway uh, for me today is that um, we are at the beginning of, of the program at Oratoire. Uh, we've got a good history in what we're doing. And really, what the company needs to do now is convert reserves into cash flow and into production. And that's what we're focused on doing. Um, and we'll do it as quickly as we can. But it's been 20 years since anybody's brought on new onshore gas in Trinidad. So, um, you know, there's, there's going to be some obstacles and some plays along the way, but, but we're pushing as hard as we can. And if, if you can't sense the excitement in my voice, um, it's there and that this Royston prospect is the next prospect looks really interesting as well. So excited to have that going on. I didn't mention too, we're also shooting 20 kilometers of uh, seismic um, that'll be done by the end of June to further define Royston, but really help define that, that deep Kraken prospect, that Cretaceous prospect um, that we look at going forward. So Donald, I, I'll turn it back over to you. I was probably a little bit longer than you wanted me to be, but I apologize for that. No, no need to apologize. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm going to sort of slightly put a dampener on things and say, let's talk COVID-19 in Trinidad as a starting point. Uh, I think it might be useful for shareholders. Everyone's getting excited at the prospects, but at the end of the day, what's happening in Trinidad at the moment is quite, there's a curfew just been, uh, been imposed and it must be quite tricky times. So how difficult is it, is it uh, for you? Well, you're in Calgary, 
yeah, the team are in Trinidad. How difficult has it been to actually sort of uh, progress things uh, in such difficult times? Yeah, I, you know, the nice thing in Trinidad is we're deemed an essential service. So, you know, from that point of view, they can still move around. For instance, even under the state of emergency, all those are curfew at night. We've got passes so our, our team can move around. And in some cases, there's less traffic on the road. So, um, you know, it's, it's a little easier to move around in some cases. I think the real challenge has been more on the paperwork side, you know, getting the government approvals and getting the NGC and, and those kind of things. You know, it'd be really nice to kind of sit down in our room and grind it out with, with the necessary parties. That's been, that's been a bigger challenge. I think the, the physical on the ground um, stuff has been moving, you know, fairly well. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think that's probably it. And, and because we operate it with virtually all uh, locals, um, we probably got a adv competitive advantage on that from that point of view. So, okay. so my, my second question, selfishly, my second question for me, uh, your, your thinking and planning is a much bigger company because your future is, is, is a, you know, you're a medium sized player. Um, so you have to ramp up your spending. You're actually uh, thinking about spending more rather than saving which has presumably been your normal mindset. You've got a more powerful uh, drilling rig due to arrive in September, for example. Has it been a difficult transition to make to start thinking of yourselves as a, as a much bigger company? Short answer to that is no. And I think if you look at the organization from the top down, it, it kind of explained that. If you look at our chairman, John Wright, or, or two or three of the people that are on board, you know, they've all been involved with multi-billion dollar organizations before, oil and gas companies. Um, in my previous life, um, you know, I've, been CEO of two previous public companies that went from roughly 600 BOEs a day to 25, 26,000 BOEs a day before they were either sold or, or parceled up. And, and um, so, you know, we've kind of been there before, we've been through this before, we know what we have to do. The, the one really nice thing about this is you get to 20,000 BOEs a day with five wells, right? It's not like you, you have 100 wells here because these are, you know, these are big wells that we're talking about. So from that point of view, logistically, it's, it's quite a bit simpler. Um, there are ser the, serious economies of scale here because you're talking yeah, so big. Yeah, I mean, your G&A costs on a BOE basis, you know, drop to pennies, um, all of those kind of things uh, kind of happen as you do it. But but the entire team, right from top to bottom, has been through this before. So we do know how to do it. And um, and we're putting some of those things in place uh, as we go forward. So I, I don't see that as a challenge. Um, I think it's uh, the challenge here for me is it's just it's a little tougher to do it in a foreign jurisdiction things just take a little longer and I'm not really a good patient person. I can, I can sense that, but that's good in an oil man. And I'm yeah. sure your shareholders think that's a terrific thing. <laughs> yeah, so the problem is though, you tend to be optimistic too. So people get frustrated with my optimism and then we get delays, right? So- But hey, you, you wouldn't know. be in the oil business if you weren't optimistic. Now I, I've got I, I lots and lots of questions. What I'm gonna do, how about we say we do 30 seconds per question. We try and get Perfect. through as many as we can. And I'm just gonna, yeah. Going to chuck, chuck them out though. So Jurgen Balderson says, uh, you said you could borrow money for development. Will you borrow money to get more wells at Cascadura quickly? 30 seconds. Short answer is yes. Um, we've already talked to the bank. They're interested in expanding the line. Um, once we have clear sight that that pipeline and facilities and everything are going to happen, yeah, we're, we're happy to step up to the plate and do that. Okay, 30 seconds. On this. James Wyman. Can you tell uh, more about the composition of the liquids? What price have you achieved for any liquids relative to Brent? What net backs do you forecast? There you go. Yeah, so the, the liquids are about 20 to 25 barrels per million. So let's say 100 million a day, you're gonna have roughly 2,500 barrels. Uh, right now, the price on the island would be Brent less 25%. So a pretty big discount to Brent. Um, we're looking at ways to maybe optimizing that by doing a direct sell to BP with some of our liquids. Um, would that be possible? Pardon me? Might that be possible? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, BP is one of the big producers on the island and they're obviously a big marketer around the world. But but right now, I think if people are using a model, it's Brent less 25%. And then you take the 12.5% uh, royalty off of that. Okay, fantastic. That's very helpful. Um, would you be interested in uh, doing joint ventures with other people such as Heritage Petroleum, asks Adrian Navarro. So uh, they're already our partner, obviously. They're 20% in this. Uh, they're a partner in all of our other uh, 21 blocks or 10 blocks that we've got on the West Coast. So they're already our partner in everything. Uh, I know there's been lots of talk about things, but, you, you know, we do partnerships with them all the time. We've, we've purchased all the 3D seismic from them. We've got two water floods that we're already doing with them. 
Um, you know, we're doing a bunch of partnerships with them already. I, I, we, we probably should talk about those more, um, but, but we work very, very closely with them. And um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, we'll continue to expand that for sure. Excellent. Peter Hamilton says, uh, uh, do you expect to release a reserves update incorporating Cascada Deep results in the next few weeks or thereafter? Yeah, the answer is no. It won't certainly won't be in the next few weeks. We've talked about that. I think what we'd really like to do is drill Royston first, get it tested, and then go from there and uh, and do a reserve report after that. Okay. So, take a holistic overview once once you've done phase one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ivor Hardy thinks you're doing a great job. Uh, please keep it up. Um, what, what model of new rig are you bringing into Trinidad and how much money do you expect to save per wall well drilled? Okay, not my area of expertise. That's a disclaimer right at the front. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a telescopic double. Uh, the key things are it's got a top drive on it. Uh, the mud pumps are much larger, which will get around some of the issues that we've dealt with. Um, we think it should save us about 25% uh, of time, um, which should be a 25% uh, savings on the rig costs. So that's, uh, that's our plan right now. A uh, million dollars up front uh, by us to move it onto the island and we have to commit to 120 days a year for the next three years. So not an onerous contract by any means. And it's, it's, it's slightly stuck between whatever it is and Trinidad at the moment, is that right? Yeah, it's in Houston, it's ready to ship. Uh, they just don't wanna ship it under the, uh, well, the Trinidad's under a state of emergency. So once that's lifted, they'll put it on a boat and send it over. Okay, what confidence, uh, Peter Hamilton, uh, asks what confidence level uh, in percentage terms do you have that Cascadura will be on production and generating revenues by the end of this year? Yeah, it's a, that's probably the key question um, for all of us. I would say right now 75% uh, it, that it is going to be on. Um, and if it's, you know, if it's slopping around a little bit, it's going to be a result of this new approach we've taken where we've asked the government for one big approval for the entire Cascadere area, for pipelines, for drilling, for roads, for facilities, for everything. Um, that may push out the start date a little bit, um, but long-term it's gonna, I'm gonna be able to sit here and talk to my shareholders and say, here's our three-year plan for Cascadere when we're done. Well, that. this is my question. Will it take you months to do that environmental impact assessment? Yeah, it's probably gonna take at least, uh, at least till September because um, we have to do some sampling uh, dry season, wet season, got to do some, you know, scouting for ocelots and all those other fun things that we need to do, which quite frankly <laughs> is a good thing to do because uh, then we can design the facilities and, and appropriately. So, Where are we? Uh, when will NGC build this bar to the Cascadura side? Uh, I, interesting. You, you thought it might all be done by May and then first gas thereafter, but somehow it hasn't. So tell us all. Yeah, I think some people got a little confused by that. We never said that Cascadero would be on in May. It, it, uh, it's always been sort of targeting the end of the year. NGC is probably ahead of us. Um, that pipeline will probably, uh, because of this new approach we're taking, NGC is not going to be the holdup at Cascadero. The holdup at Cascadero will be how quickly we can get approvals to build our part of that uh, or part of that process. All right. Paul? We've still got tons and tons of questions, but uh, the horrible and honest reality is we've come to the end of our time. So yeah. uh, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us from Calgary today uh, to update us on, uh, on the happenings in Trinidad. Thank you so much. It's really fascinating. Thanks for including us and uh, thanks for running the slides for me, Mike. Appreciate that. Next up, it's Shanta Gold. Shanta Gold is an East Africa focused gold producer, developer and explorer listed on AIM. Shanta has evolved from a single asset producer to a 3 million ounce resources gold company with a diversified portfolio of growth assets. Uh, the company is focused on its flagship asset, the new Luca gold mine located in Southwest Tanzania. It has two other development projects at Singida in Tanzania and, and, and also in West Kenya. The West Kenya one has uh, been the, sort of the, the topic of a RNS uh, this morning. You have a market cap of around 172 million up 9% on today's news from West Kenya. Over to you, Eric. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Donald. Uh, appreciate being here tonight. Just to start off tonight, um, we have a special guest with us joining as well, um, Yuri Dobrotin, who is our group head of exploration. And um, we'll be taking you through some of the highlights we announced this morning from our West Kenya project, as well as covering the 
value proposition for Shanta because it's, we think, particularly exciting around the exploration front. I should have said happy Africa Day. Um, May 25th of every year is Africa Day and it's a pleasure to be taking you through the Shanta story. On the call also with me is Luke Leslie, CFO. Luke and I have worked together for many years. And as I mentioned, Yuri Dobrotin, who's joined us from Barrick at the start of the year. Yuri is a global gold expert uh, with 35 years experience. He was part of the discovery team at West Kenya. He's lived and worked across all of the major greenstone gold belts around the world and is a huge asset for Shanta. And so we'll be hearing a bit more from Yuri to cover today's results and the exploration plans uh, at Shanta. I should also introduce our board, uh, particularly Michelle Jenkins, who's just joined us recently. Uh, Michelle is also a, an exploration geologist and a, a chartered accountant. Um, moving along to an introduction on Shanta Gold. Some of you may know about Shanta. We are the third largest gold producer in Tanzania. We've have a diversified asset base across East Africa and Tanzania now in Kenya as well. We're unhedged. We have a net cash position on the balance sheet and we're trading at very undemanding multiples, 3.1 times EBITDA, 13 times earnings, and just recently paid our maiden dividend and trading on a 1.3% dividend yield. So very attractive from a fundamental perspective. And this excludes the growth in our portfolio. On the bottom side, bottom half of the page, you'll see here, we are owned by some of the most uh, well-known household names in terms of um, shareholders, uh, Fidelity, BlackRock, River Mercantile, uh, all out of London, uh, OD Asset Management, renamed Brook, uh, which has been a shareholder now for many years. Insiders and management own 6.5% of the company, uh, well aligned with our shareholders. A brief introduction into the, the proposition. Why Shanta Gold? What's so exciting? Well, you'll see on the next page how we're allocating capital this year. And it's really important because a lot of that capital has been allocated to growth, and predominantly exploration. Now, what we're showing on this slide is a comparison of how we're valued in the market versus what we think the value of our portfolio is. And we put down a few markers to give you that comparison. In summary, we think we're trading at about one third of the value of what we can demonstrate. So we have three assets, the new Luwika gold mine being the one in production with significant exploration, exploration upside. And we'll take you through that uh, in a few minutes. We then have the Singida asset, which is in construction. Um, again, exploration upside. This is a green stone deposit in Tanzania. And then the West Kenya asset, we, the one we acquired from Barrick last year, the one we put out drilling results on this morning, six meters at 220 grams per ton, three meters at 72 grams per ton, and so on and so forth. Very, very exciting. Uh, the West Kenya project is possibly one of the highest grading um, undeveloped gold projects in all of Africa. 1.2 million ounces grading 12.6 grams per ton. And it is in the heart of the Lake Victoria gold belt in uh, just across the border from Tanzania. So we'll cover that in a, in a few minutes. My final slide before I hand over to, to Yuri really is around how we're allocating capital and why we're doing so. You can see here that we have three assets as we've introduced, 35, um, just under $35 million of growth capital being allocated this year across those three assets, half of which is in exploration and the other half is in construction at Singida. This is the most we've ever spent in exploration in a given year. Why are we doing that? Well, we are building on recent successes in past years of A, expanding or extending the reserve-based mine life in the Luika. Two, upgrading the resources at West Kenya, and you've, you can see that clearly in the results that we've published this morning, and also extending or expanding the resource base across our portfolio. And then three, bringing a third asset into construction and into production at Singida. It's really important to think hard about the dollars we spend in exploration. We believe we can generate multiples of value return 
on the dollars we spend. I'll give you an example. At near the weekend, in the first quarter, we added nearly a mine life, one year of mine life at uh, eight grams per ton on the back of spending um, about half a million dollars of drilling. At West Kenya this morning, the results were absolutely staggering uh, and the inbox has been full from other gold companies, advisors, um, in, investors, shareholders, just really, really thrilled by what we're, we're doing and what we're showing and showcasing at the West Kenya project. So it's one to keep your eye on. There will be ongoing updates throughout the year and another one next month. Yuri will now take us through the West Kenya slides and a bit more on the exploration. Yuri? Karibuni sana, Kenya. Welcome to Kenya. Uh, so what you can see, what we can see in this slide is a long section of the deposit which we're uh, exploring, uh, calling Bushingala and Izulu. So it's lo long section is two kilometers long and approximately one kilometers deep. So you can see this uh, resource outlined with the uh, yellow outline and uh, what we can see on top uh, these red boxes they are uh, uh, highlighting the uh, current uh, drilling what we are doing as a phase one of converting the inferred low confidence reserve into the higher category which uh, with the aim to uh, convert them to the mineable reserve so we're finishing now the stage one of these uh, red boxes and moving into the uh, next stage phase two these blue outlines below for the deeper levels what we can also see on this slide are the um, exploration uh, targets and upside potential which is very very important we have to remember this this uh, discovery is just a baby it's just three four years old and um, uh, uh, it uh, has a big uh, way to grow. Uh, all of the uh, greenstone deposits usually they are growing from smaller to bigger. So this uh, exploration target is shown here as uh, black dash circles in three categories. The number one is a very exciting uh, uh, category of targets inside of the known ore bodies for the very high grade shoots and the example of it we will be showing next slide. Uh, next one is uh, just extension, number two, extension of the known ore bodies down deep and down plunge. And number three is the new targets, new targets which can be converted into the resources with the more, uh, the more drilling. And next slide, please. Uh, next slide will be, um, uh, it's, uh, I think it's still coming on the, yes, thank you. Next slide is showing the example of the high grade shoots. Uh, left uh, picture is um, demonstrating the uh, geometry of the highest grade intercepts and uh, the area when, where we uh, encounter um, uh, visible gold and uh, uh, white and uh, high grade um, uh, gold um, uh, values. So this is about 900 meters vertical uh, extent, what we can see on the left picture. And uh, until recently, we were thinking this uh, very high grade uh, shoots are mostly potential in the deeper levels. As a, this is a solid black line, type one uh, in the yellow box. And uh, uh, inside of this black line, we have multiple, a few dozens of uh, high-grade intercepts with the amazing uh, gold, um, gold uh, nuggets and constellate gold constellations in the core, which is quite rare for this type of the deposits. So this lower uh, couple of pictures show uh, uh, show the example of these uh, amazing nuggets in the core. Uh, until recently, we were thinking that uh, would be the main potential for the high grade, as I said. However, recent results, which were published this morning, uh, show that uh, it's not, not, not quite true. We have the same potential for the amazing high grade shoots up, upstairs as well in the shallower level of, of the deposit. And uh, one of the best, which uh, Eric already mentioned, is uh, uh, shown here on, on the slide on the right up uh, side. Uh, so what is uh, good about it? Uh, it's not just only one sample, which is uh, pushing the whole intercept up uh, with the grade. 
you have a series of uh, uh, very high grade uh, 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 samples, 53 grams, 185, 440, 200 grams. We triple check all of these results uh, in, in the lab, running the duplicates and running the rejects. Uh, and we confirm all of these numbers are true. And it's no wonder because uh, it's so much visible gold in through the whole, uh, through the whole like, location. So um, I, I must say that I, what I'm doing um, now, exploring for gold, I'm doing for 35 years across five continents. And uh, I never seen so much uh, visible gold in the core for these stages. It's usually on the next stage when we already have a mine and we're drilling null shoots. But in this early stage is quite unique. And it has a, it gives us a very good hope that these high grade shoots, uh, even small, they uh, could be a game changer for, for the deposit and, and bring this whole economics up. And next slide, please, Eric. Um, uh, I think it's coming now. Uh, next, next slide will be showing the, uh, uh, the step, step out. So we have a big uh, exploration ground. It's not only, oh, here we are. It's not only Izuvu in Pushingala, as you can see on the left uh, picture. Uh, the, uh, we uh, own uh, the exploration licenses for about 80 kilometers in the most prospective part of the, what we call the uh, Busia Kakamega Greenstone Belt in Kenya, completely underexplored. We're uh, exploring here since um, uh, 2015 uh, with a lot of a lot of drilling, and uh, we uh, identify um, numbers of very exciting exciting targets, and some of them are already kind of pre-resource stage. An example of it is shown on the right uh, right side of the picture. Uh, it is Ramula, uh, which is a, a genetic analogy of the. Uh, wonderful discoveries are happening, st still happening in Canada, in Waldor district, which is more hundred years old, mature mining and exploration district. Uh, we have this absolutely the same twin uh, genetic style deposits, and uh, it's uh, they are very difficult to find, but they are relatively inexpensive to explore because you, every hole can uh, penetrate through several. Uh, or, or body, potential or bodies, several, several planes. So uh, uh, this is an unexplored ca camp, uh, unexplored uh, district, and Izulu Bushingala is just the beginning, we believe. Uh, yes, please, the next slide. Uh, I think next slide will be when we will be moving to uh, Tanzania. Uh, so, uh, welcome to Tan Tanzania, uh, which is sh should be on the screen in, in a second. Uh, so, on the upper uh, upper right uh, side, uh, we can see our new Luica mine license, uh, where we have uh, seven ore bodies included in the life of mine, and the two uh, leaders, two champions, are uh, Luica and BC. <clears throat> which uh, we zoom in, in into the left slide, left side of the slide. Uh, this, are two, uh, this is the inclined view, inclined view, or uh, do, uh, looking along the faults. These faults are displacing the ore bodies. I just uh, joined the company a few few months ago, uh, five months ago, and I'm really excited to see that uh, proper 3D modeling and uh, de deta detailed. Um, uh, de detailed login and uh, uh, combination of many different exploration methods can really uh, bring a lot of upside potential there, especially for the deep extensions and for, as well as for the blind ore bodies. So what is interesting on this left, left slide, this is an example of uh, this 3D modeling, which is uh, uh, delivering us uh, amazing opportunity this uh, fault, which is running from running from left side to the right side of the slide, is a displacement. So the ore bodies were chopped along this fault. However, detailed uh, detailed review shows that they, may, they must have extension over this fault on both sides, and uh, deeper, uh, higher grade shoots uh, should be um, should uh, should be coming. So 
uh, we are drilling now with four drill rigs there, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, all all inclu included into the big tenement package uh, surround surround this uh, mining license, which is more than thousand square kilometers. So please stay tuned for the new um, uh, new press releases about our drilling results. And Asanta Sana, thank you. So this is the Singida project, and this will be our next mine in Tanzania. We uh, think this is a pretty significant project because it'll bring the group production up to over 100,000 ounces a year. And it's also going to be a significant uh, contributor to cash flow. So we're expecting in 2022, uh, sorry, 2023, for uh, Singida to contrib contribute 30 to 40 percent of Tanzanian cash flow. Um, now, what's also exciting about this project is that we'll start off with a relatively small um, level of production, but the exploration is um, is very exciting, and we expect that we will have opportunities later on to uh, to increase the production, increase the reserves. So this is a greenstone belt with very high potential. Um, we'll bring it into production at the end of next year. So it's um, this will uh, this will have a very significant bearing on the company's profile. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Eric, thank you. Um, now, two, we're two months into a new presidency in Tanzania, and this is um, uh, there's been some pretty significant uh, changes already. Um, the new president is very pro-business. She's been specific about uh, trying to entice uh, mi miners back into the country, and she's also talking about VAT, as um, everyone I believe is aware we have a significant VAT receivable. It's uh, around $30 million today. Now, what I can tell you is that um, the, the auditing has, uh, is, is continuing um, on, a, I guess, as a new business as usual uh, for, the, for the government. And we, it, we believe that already we have implicit approvals for some of the, uh, the VAT. So we'll update the market in due course, but there's been a significant progress on that front. Um, I think the, the final uh, point that I'd like to make in terms of the, the new president is that she's, she's also committed to uh, bringing mining up from 6.5% of Tanzania's GDP to 10% by 2025. Thank you, uh, Luke. And we'll just wrap up here on the catalyst slide um, to give you a feel for what's, what to expect over the next couple of months. Um, first and foremost, more drilling results. We expect to have another set of results out in June, probably from West Kenya and New Luika, given there's quite a bit of activity on the ground, and an updated resource at West Kenya specifically in July. We'll provide an update on an ongoing update around the Singida construction, how that's moving ahead. We've uh, started work on a five-year plan. It's, uh, proud moment given we haven't had a five-year plan in some time and we've now made enough progress to get to that point and have the confidence to share that so we'll have that out in the, in the third quarter as well along with our q2 results and our, our interim results probably in the back end of august um, with that i'll hand over to the back to the host to um, take any questions great thank you eric that was terrific um, I'm going to jump straight in and ask you, uh, you know, good news from the drill bit in West Kenya today. Um, the, 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 the share price certainly shot up. Um, was the market right to get excited about phase one results today as it did? On the other hand, there's plenty, plenty of drilling still to go. So, you know, was that market reaction the right thing? No, we, uh, we, we thought it was a bit soft, actually, but, um, you know, that's, that's been optimist. Listen, Donald, the... the there's scarcity in those kinds of results. It's hard to find that type of grade yep. in in a greenstone deposit anywhere in the world. I mean, you you know you can Google it, you can look for it. Um, they're eye watering, really. And you know we have a long way to go to to being able to to produce the first you know Dore bar, but this absolutely shows the value in this project. There is the gold is there, and 
you know, it's up to us to make sure that we can demonstrate the value in this project, which I'm, I'm absolutely positive we can. It's super exciting. It's what we've been waiting for. Um, and compared to the purchase price we had, you know, I think we paid $14.5 million for this asset back in August. Um, it's, it's, you know, I'm sure it's multiples of that today. Um, and it's just a matter how, of time. How, how does it rate alongside New Luica, for example? Bigger, smaller? In terms of resource, potential? well, well, a greenstone deposit is always more interesting because it has the it has the hallmarks of being bigger, uh, whereas New Luica isn't a greenstone deposit. So, you know, that's a that's a big plus in terms of a starting point. The grades are spectacular. I mean, a Bonanza grade is 32, 33 grams per ton. This is eight times as good as that um, in places, and you know, we already have a huge head start with a 1.2 million ounce resource there. It's granted, it's inferred, but um, you know, this is, as Yuri said, this was discovered three or four years ago, and it's just, we're literally just scratching the surface. Uh, what are your next steps in West Kenya then? Well, we've, we've committed to drilling, um, and so we raised money to do that last, uh, last October. So we've committed to drilling up to 150,000 meters. Again, as I said, we've scratched the surface. We've done, I think, now six or 7,000 meters of that, um, you know, small amounts. And, uh, and we'll continue to provide updates. Um, at some point soon, we're, you know, we're going to have to transition to thinking about studies. How does this project look? What are the steps we need to do to get through permitting, um, you know, so social acceptance, um, bringing this project on a path towards production? Because we're getting enough confidence that this will, you know, this very well could be, a, uh, be the first major gold mine in, in Kenya. Would that count as a, a, a tier one or a tier two, or do you not see these these terms as relevant? Well, I mean, in my view, tier tier one, according to Barrick, is ten years at five hundred thousand ounces of production per year. For, for me, what's what matters is that the the asset is highly economic. You know, so this is this is a profitable asset. It can be it can be constructed. The capital is um, you know sufficiently manageable, which it is. We have the right skills because it's long hole open stoping. So we have that, we can borrow that from Tanzania and we have the right culture and the right recipe. So we have this, you know, we have a, a playbook that works extremely well in Tanzania around local content and, uh, and being supportive of the government uh, and community. And that's something we're rolling out in Kenya at the same time. Mining is a long-term game, um, you know, to try and think you can figure it out in a couple of quarters is absolutely wrong. It's, okay. You have to think. 10, 20, 30 years. That's a, that's a good answer, Eric, which takes us neatly to Ben Sharman's question. And he says, so what are the timescales to bring on production at West Kenya? And will the ore be processed at the site or shipped to the processing plant in Tanzania? I think he's, he's thinking very far in the future, but nevertheless, you know, have you thought about those, thought, those things? We certainly have. And, um, you know, part of that work was we, we announced a scoping study back in October for the West Kenya project, and it will be a standalone uh, project. There's just, it's, it's just, it's too far and it's too complicated crossing borders for, with ore. But um, what we said back in uh, the second half of last year, it's, it's probably zero to five years away from production. So now here we are, you know, eight months later. So we're, you know, we're coming towards the four year, four years to production. We hope we can do it quicker than that. Um, but we don't want to make promises that we can't keep. So you know, we, we're going to stick with that. What's important is that we're demonstrating value along the way. And, uh, and this project is seriously exciting with these kinds of grades. Okay, hopefully I'm not going to completely take you back here, but could you, could you take us back to the slide where Luke was talking about the, the new president, please? Um, he talked about 30 million of, of, revenue, of VAT revenues uh, due. And my question, and he said, some of it he thinks is going to come, uh, come back. And so, of course, my journalistic brain goes, to what extent can you tell us how much of that VAT do you expect to be able to get back, uh, Luke? Yeah, uh, Donald, I can't say much more than that, other than um, you know, nothing's, nothing's confirmed um, so far. There is a, a, an element of interpretation in, in um, uh, kind of legally uh, what's, what's uh, defined as being imp implicitly approved. So it's something we're working on now, but we're, we're, feeling, we're feeling pretty... Uh, we're feeling pretty good about it um, and we'll put something out um, in the near future. Sure, as soon as you can, yeah. Okay, but uh, that, uh, is it possible to talk, talk us through how, how potentially important the role of the new president might be? She seems much more business friendly president. 
Yeah, look, absolutely. We're, we're seeing it um, you know, on the ground every week. Um, you know, the, it, there's, there's, we pay a lot of tax in Tanzania. And for us, uh, things can either move quickly with permitting or they move slowly. And, and what we're seeing is she wants to uh, reduce the tax burden on, on, on individual companies and she wants to find other ways to broaden um, tax collection. So, you know, we're seeing much more activity with the, with the Tanzanian revenue and um, you know, a lot of encouragement on Singida as well. So, you know, it's, it's, things, are, things are looking very good so far. Fantastic. Okay, back to Eric. Um, uh, an overview question. There you go. You'll be relieved. Uh, an easier one. Uh, where are we in the current gold cycle as you see it? And to what extent does the gold cycle influence your forward planning? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, listen, our, our view is, you know, we're, we're wild optimists when it comes to gold. Um, you know, no, no surprise given we're running a gold company. But the reality is, is, you know, we can't, we can't predict the gold price as much as we want to. Our job is to produce the gold as profitably as possible and to be good custodians of capital for the shareholders. So the best way for us to mitigate any gold price volatility is to keep our costs down and to keep the gold um, being produced. And it becomes a relative game at that point because um, you know, anyone who isn't doing that will be um, significantly worse off. Now, what I can say is that for the first time in a very, 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 very long time, Shant is unhedged you know, as of uh, December last year. And you know, when you look at the fundamentals for gold, you see, you know, the, the crypto is kind of self-destructing. Um, gold's been around for a long time. You, you might think that gold has a pretty good future. I do. Um, but, um, you know, we'll have to all see. Okay. What would, what would the, if, if we're, we're coming to your last question, essentially, uh, what would be the last thing that you would like to say to your audience tonight? Perhaps it's a, an investment summary. Perhaps it's a why you should hold the, the Shanta Gold stock. Uh, there you go. Over to you. Yeah, keep your eye on the exploration because it has the opportunity or it has, you know, it has the potential of generating multiples on your money. Um, and ex there's only one way to do that in mining, really. It's exploration. It's not production. Um, exploration, exploration and gold prices is, is, the, is the source of all riches historically. So keep your eye on that. That's why we're spending a lot of money in that department. And, um, you're not, not just a producer, but you're actually actively exploring at the moment. You think yeah. that's, where you get it, that's where you get the best return on your money? Absolutely, yeah. If you get it right, it's um, you know it's phenomenal returns. If you get it right. Okay, and if you had to sum up uh, Shanta Gold in 30, uh, 30 seconds, how would you do that? Well, we're a fully funded gold producer in, uh, in a region we know incredibly well. We've been operating for, for 20 years. A diversified portfolio of fantastic assets. A team backed by incredible skill. Um, you know, Yuri's on the call. And, uh, and a playbook that, um, that's worked very, very well for us. And so when you look at the fundamentals, the valuation entry point, uh, the fact that we pay a dividend, we're unhedged, great exposure to gold price, and the exploration, which is the one that can really drive a lot of value for the shareholders. Okay, Eric, thank you so much for that summary. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you to Eric Zurin, uh, the CEO. I'd like to say thank you to Luke Leslie, the CFO. And a special thank you to Yuri de Broughton. Next up, we have Savannah Resources. Savannah is an AIM-listed lithium explorer and developer with two development stage projects, uh, Mina de Barroso, a hard rock lithium project in Portugal, which is the largest spodumene lithium resource in Europe, and the world-class Munchamba heavy mineral sands project in Mozambique, which is being developed in a consortium with the global major Rio Tinto. Today's SAV market cap that sits at 62 million. And tonight we're delighted to welcome uh, David Archer, CEO of Savannah Resources. Over to you, David. Um, thank you so much, uh, Donald. I'm very um, delighted and um, honored uh, to be on uh, the uh, call uh, tonight. And I'd like to introduce you to uh, Savannah and uh, Mina de Brosso Lithium Project in northeast, um, northeast Portugal. We believe the project um, really will be uh, the uh, raw materials sort of centerpiece uh, for Europe's energy transition. Looking at uh, sort of the company from a 
higher higher level. Um, it is the, the largest sort of conventional uh, spodumene lithium project in Europe. Um, it means that um, in terms of uh, development risk, um, that's um, very much sort of moderated because of the sort of long track record of uh, sort of successful development of uh, hard rock spodumene uh, deposits, particularly in Australia, um, which is now uh, sort of the largest global producer of lithium, uh, lithium raw materials. Um, we're in Europe, um, which is a, which is a great thing um, because Europe really um, can be uh, the sort of leading sort of global producer of electric vehicles. So uh, there's a very sort of natural market uh, for the lithium raw materials uh, that we'll be uh, we'll be producing. We hope to be in production um, fully in uh, 2023. Means relatively early cash flow, and we believe that um, we enjoy it essentially an early mover advantage and um, we could be the sort of first um, significant producer of um, lithium uh, raw materials in Europe. And of course, you know, there's very much sort of sur surging demand as we've sort of seen. Um, in 2020, uh, there were just over a million electric vehicle uh, sales in um, uh, in Europe. Uh, that'll probably go up to about seven to eight million uh, electric vehicles in Europe by, uh, by uh, 2025. So that's going to be a very major increase. VW, for example, um, is producing around about 1,600 uh, EVs per day, and that will be uh, sort of close to 600,000 uh, units um, over, over the year. So, you know, very significant. We're also sort of seeing a major build out in, uh, in gigafactories. There are something like uh, 30 um, individual uh, gigafactories either uh, in operation, in construction, or slated, uh, slated for, um, for development. And of course, you know, one of the key things uh, that I'll talk about a little bit later is that um, all of this um, is anchored uh, via an off-taken project level in investment with, with GALP, um, which is a European energy major and the second largest uh, Portuguese uh, listed, uh, listed company. Um, just in terms of the executive team, and um, you know, I think for a, a junior company, I think we've really got a got a great team uh, of um, of um, industry professionals. I've been involved in the successful development of at least three large um, publicly listed companies. Um, two in the resources space, one in the um, oil and gas space, and, um, and a fourth one in, uh, in the telecommunications sector. I'm supported by Dale Ferguson, who's um, I believe you know one of the leading um, industry executives, and um, he and I have been working um, in in close cooperation since two thousand and three. Um, we have uh, Michael McGarty, our CFO, a, a very sort of good group of um, in-country professionals, both in uh, Portugal and Mozambique, where we also have a, um, a very exciting mineral sands project, and um, and uh, ably led by um, Asa Bridal on the business development side. Um, just looking at the, the company itself, uh, we're headquartered in, in London, uh, where, I'm, where I'm based. Uh, we've been incorporated since 2010. And what we're really doing is looking to sort of focus on Nina de Brosso, which we sort of believe holds, you know, great uh, current sort of potential. And of course, you know, uh, Portugal itself, you know, we believe um, has uh, sort of very significant um, exploration potential. We're certainly very well placed uh, to play a leading role in um, defining sort of further resources in, in Portugal, particularly on the back of um, the uh, international lithium tender that the Portuguese government will announce um, or will action later, later this year. We've got a 27 million tonne resource. We started off with a zero uh, million tonne resource when we uh, secured the project in 2017. It's been one of the fastest um, resource drill outs, I think, uh, that's been seen in Europe in recent decades. And it's you know, very much a, a conventional uh, mine development, relatively small in mining industry terms, but significant in terms of the um, strategic importance of the spodumene lithium uh, that we'll actually be producing. I mentioned the arrangement with, uh, with GALP, um, and really what we've sort of seen um, over the last six to nine months is um, an extraordinary um, growth in um, investment interest in, um, in lithium and um, you know, particularly in uh, projects in, in Europe, um, which 
um, you know, sort of is the key sort of jurisdiction, key geography for, um, uh, for, for lithium demand. And as I mentioned, we've got plenty of exploration potential, both on you know, some of our exploration license applications and sort of more broadly uh, within the um, Iberian Peninsula. Um, we have a market cap at the moment of about 60 million uh, pounds um, that um, sort of compares very favorably with the um, scoping study NPV, uh, which showed um, uh, a 365 million um, uh, before tax um, NPV based on um, a, a, a relatively uh, conservative uh, scodumene lithium price of about 685 US dollars a ton. Um, the international price is now 700 US dollars a ton. And um, yeah, we think that provides a very sort of solid base for a mine, mine development uh, decision. Um, the capital, ex uh, capital expenditure is relatively modest at about 109 uh, million uh, US dollars. So um, yeah, very, um, very achievable. Just talking a little bit about um, Europe and um, you know, really the, the imperatives here are, are very sort of key. Uh, the European Commission wants to uh, protect and, um, and uh, allow the European uh, car industry to make a successful transition into electric vehicle uh, production. So sort of clearly um, the European Commission and um, citizenry of, um, of Europe would like um, also to see um, you know, meaningful um, progress in terms of meeting uh, CO2 targets. This move to electric mobility will be sort of key to that. And of course, you know, this, the sustainability and, um, um, and, re and resilience aspects of having um, European production is also uh, very key as well. So European Commission wants to really sort of see an end-to-end -end lithium value chain developed in Europe, as you see at the bottom of this slide. And, you know, we can sort of really uh, provide, you know, perhaps the sort of initial sort of core of uh, sort of production um, to sort of fill out the, um, the raw material productions end of things and also sort of to provide the um, raw material feed uh, that might be able to um, underwrite the development of um, a new refining or, or mineral conversion industry here in, in Europe, um, you know, whether that's in the Iberian Peninsula or potentially in Germany, uh, Poland and, um, and, and Finland. And really, you know, Europe wants to be independent. Uh, China is you know, very much the uh, centerpiece of um, lithium, uh, lithium product development um, and um, Europe really wants to play a major role itself. We've been looking at lithium really since uh, 2016, um, initially had a look in uh, Finland. We decided that uh, Portugal was the uh, preferred jurisdiction and we've certainly been proved right on that. Um, our glint in the eye is now sort of being turned into, you know, one of um, Europe's most um, significant uh, lithium uh, resource developments. We've been moving forward very quickly with our uh, development path. Um, we've completed a scoping study um, we've uh, acquired the balance of the ownership of the, the project. We lodged an EIA at the end of May of last year, and we announced uh, an off-take deal with GALP um, in January of this year. And we're now moving through uh, the um, EIA uh, approval process, um, and we will sort of shortly sort of conclude uh, the sort of public consultation process um, um, which has been underway for the last um, last few weeks. ESG is really a, a, a key element in um, any mine development, um, whether it's uh, Kenya, Tanzania, or um, or Portugal. Um, and of course, you know, we've been putting an enormous amount of effort in, into this. Our EIA um, has demonstrated uh, this uh, commitment. It's um, 6,000 pages long. It illustrates uh, 238 individual uh, programs and uh, management initiatives uh, that will help to uh, manage, eliminate or mitigate any environmental and social, uh, social impacts. Uh, we've invest, we will be investing something of the order of 15 million uh, euros in terms of uh, initiatives to um, minimise uh, minimize impacts. We will be undertaking progressive rehabilitation and we'll be introducing a number of you know, very innovative and industry leading initiatives, including real time uh, monitoring of um, our environmental KPIs and um, so sort of releasing that to community and stakeholders uh, via an app. Um, we're also looking at um, some, you know, very leading um, social programs. We've designed a, a benefit sharing uh, program, um, which will help fund worthy uh, social 
and um, environmental uh, sort of programs um, for our community and for our region. And of course, will be a major job creator and uh, a major income generator for the uh, local municipality, which can sort of feed further revenues uh, back into uh, worthy, uh, worthy initiatives. Of course, we're listed on the London Stock Exchange. Governance aspects are very sort of key, and and also sort of a key element in terms of you know people like Dame LeBenz uh, when they buy lithium-ion batteries, they want to know that um, the lithium has been uh, so produced sustainably and from reliable uh, sources, you know, from jurisdictions with um, excellent environmental uh, labour and uh, sort of general governance uh, sort of frameworks. And we'll be introducing a, an industry-leading uh, environmental social uh, management system uh, which will sort of comprehensively manage uh, the, ESG, the ESG aspects of the project. Um, green power will be very important and we'll be feeding uh, the, the plant with electricity generated from the abundant um, uh, renewable resources in northern Portugal, wind, um, hydro and, um, and um, certainly solar. We'll be looking to transition the diesel fleet uh, from uh, diesel into uh, sort of renewable powered uh, fleet, you know, possibly electric, possibly um, hydrogen. And um, you know, what we'll be able to produce is effectively a, a, a premium carbon neutral uh, spodumene hard rock uh, sort of concentrate um, that will be you know, highly sought after uh, by um, European sort of consumers of the, um, of the material. Um, just briefly on on some of the um, on some of, some of the economics, we enjoy um, outstanding economics. We um, our C one cash cost um, is around about two hundred and seventy one US dollars a, a ton. Um, you might ask, why is this so? Um, for, uh, for, uh, fortunately, Portugal is a, a low cost jurisdiction. Um, uh, labour rates are a fraction of the labour rates in Australia, our key competitor. Um, we enjoy uh, the production of co-products, both uh, quartz and feldspar, uh, which have a, a very um, sort of buoyant and, uh, and significant uh, market in, in, in both uh, sort of Portugal and, um, and Spain. Um, if you've ever been to Portugal and Spain, you probably will have noticed um, the um, ceramic tiles, which uh, are, are pretty much everywhere. The geometry of the deposit um, helps as well. It's tabular near surface um, and enjoys a very low uh, stripping ratio. And finally, um, we won't be shipping the material to China. We'll be shipping it um, hopefully to a, a refinery in Northern uh, Portugal um, or you know, sort of potentially um, to Northern European ports. So you know, a significantly um, um, smaller sort of uh, transportation uh, cost um, associated with the, um, with the mine development. Um, just sort of talking about some of the key um, elements, we'll be producing a 6% uh, spodumene lithium product. That's very much uh, sort of the global uh, lithium standard. Um, we, we're certainly in the money um, in terms of um, our sort of projected uh, uh, revenue for the, uh, for the mine development. And really the mine development sort of shows some really um, attractive um, investment metrics, uh, which has an NPV post-tax of a quarter of a billion uh, US dollars. Um, and that was based on a, um, a much smaller resource than we currently have. It was based on a 14 million tonne resource, not a 27 million tonne resource. So I think you can look forward to that NPV moving up. Shows you know really attractive IRR numbers, uh, quick paybacks, which means the demand uh, development financing um, will be um, relatively easier uh, to secure. Um, originally, a mine life of 11 years, I think we'll be sort of pushing out past, uh, past 20 years. This is going to be a long-term reliable supply of um, spodumene lithium for the, um, for the European market. Just so you just have a little bit of a look at the, the, the mine itself. It's important to remember that this is a granted mining lease. Uh, it's got a 30 year term run through to 2036. We're already mining there at the moment and uh, we're producing sort of quartz and feldspar. So our EIA is really looking to um, expand um, our production scope, put in uh, value added processing and um, essentially, uh, this is in many ways a, a brownfield site development. Uh, this is certainly not a, a greenfield site development. And you can sort of see uh, the quarrying uh, that's going on on the projects at, at the moment. This shows the, uh, the, the resource in terms of how it's grown. As I mentioned, it's uh, grown from a zero tonne resource in 2017. 
um, through to 27 million tonnes today, and we're sort of guiding to there being sort of ultimately something in the order of a, a 20 million, uh, sorry, a 50 million tonne resource, as you can see from this um, final bar in the, uh, the bar chart. It's high quality spodumene, it's got very low iron. Um, that's one of sort of the, the key contaminants. So it's um, globally uh, one of the lowest iron um, spodumene lithium, uh, lithiums in, in the world. Um, and um, otherwise uh, has very low level, uh, low levels of contaminants, a, a very saleable, clean uh, spodumene lithium concentrate. This is a little bit of a, a mud map of um, how the, the mine development might, might look. Uh, we're looking at um, a sequential uh, pit development over four pits over the life of the mine. The principal one here being, uh, being Grandour. Um, which has something of the order of 50% uh, of the overall, overall resource. Um, we'll be using conventional um, uh, drilling, um, drilling, a drill and blast, uh, crush, crush and grind, and using you know, what is now a relatively well proven and sort of conventional uh, processing circuit uh, that's sort of been uh, stress tested um, in a number of mines in in, um, in, in Australia to produce around about 200,000 tonnes of spodumene concentrate uh, per annum, which you know, would be able to, um, which is equivalent to something of the order of 5% of um, Europe's requirement in, um, in 2030. Just briefly on um, on GALP, uh, this was a deal we announced in on the 12th of, uh, 12th of January. Um, GALP is making a, a very determined transition uh, from its oil and gas business into the energy transition. They're actually sort of the largest uh, solar producer on the uh, Iberian Peninsula. They'll be investing 6.4 million uh, to secure a 10% shareholding in the project at the project level. Um, and um, they'll be taking uh, something of the order of 100,000 tonnes of spodumene concentrate, which is about 50% of our, our sort of projected uh, uh, production. And of course, you know, it's great having a partner like uh, Galp um, being a, a, a very well regarded uh, corporate citizen in, in Portugal itself. <coughs> This um, slide is really pretty key um, because I think it really highlights um, you know, the, uh, the ap appealing geography that we sort of sit in, abundant uh, renewable power. That's really important uh, to consumers of the lithium that it's got a, a low CO2 footprint, only about 140 kilometres from uh, the port of Leixos, which is the second largest port in, um, in Portugal. Certainly uh, potential for uh, a refinery, uh, for example, to be sort of constructed in northern uh, Portugal using our material as the um, base load sort of feedstock. And of course, um, have, being on the coast gives us access to uh, northern European ports um, where there are a number of uh, sort of mooted uh, lithium conversion plants uh, being, being planned to be developed. So um, this sort of really outlines some of our achievements uh, to date. Uh, 2021 will uh, be a, a continuing um, sort of busy, busy year for us, um, both both in terms of um, all going well, um, receiving our EIA approval. Uh, that's really on a, a very sort of so solid pathway um, at the moment. Um, we will be looking to complete our definitive feasibility study. We'll probably be sort of expanding our exploration uh, activities, both within Portugal and, um, and Spain, and then sort of move into final investment decision um, next year financing uh, mine construction and uh, and full scale and full scale um, production in 2023 um, just quickly on the investment case conscious of time moving by uh, but you know we will be a significant uh, producer of lithium carbonate equivalent um, the second largest in, uh, in in Europe we've got a very modest market cap in, in comparison to our European peers. And um, we have a superior IRR. So um, I think those three slides um, you know, pretty much sort of summarise um, the investment appeal of, um, of, of, of our company. So in summary, it's a, a rapidly growing market in, in Europe at, at the moment. Um, demand is increasingly increasing at a, at, at a fantastic pace. Um, and Europe is likely to be the, the second largest, if not the largest, um, uh, lithium battery manufacturing centre uh, sort of globally. 
Um, we believe Mina de Brosso is the right project at the right time in the, in, in the right geography. Um, it's got um, short latency. It can play a meaningful um, role in terms of um, you know, providing some degree of um, lithium independence uh, for, uh, for, for Europe. Um, importantly, it has a, a low carbon footprint. We'll be using uh, renewable power. We'll be looking to uh, layer in a, um, a non-diesel powered fleet. Uh, we think we've got very attractive um, investment fundamentals in comparison to our um, industry peers. Um, we're seeing you know, enormous demand uh, from uh, various groups looking to sort of secure the balance of our non-GALP uh, uh, committed uh, production. So um, I think we could probably sort of sell our uh, full production a number of uh, times over. And it's going to be a, um, a, a news packed uh, balance uh, to 2021 and uh, we'll be achieving major milestones in 2022 and 23. Um, and we believe um, Savannah will lead the way with um, Mina de Brosso providing sort of a, a vital strategic foundation to uh, Europe's energy transition. So that's that's it in in summary. Okay, David, you've uh, you've earmarked 2022, 20, 2023 as being busy years. What about uh, in the next six months? Let's what are the what are the, what's the new flow, news flow you expect in the in the next six months? Um, I, I suppose, well, let's say to the um, end of the year, so I don't tax my um, mental arithmetic too much. Uh, mental arithmetic too you're, much. you're allowed to the end of the year. Okay, all right. Um, well, yeah, certainly um, EIA progress will be um, be wrapping up the community consultation um, in, um, in sort of coming weeks. Um, you know, we hope that we'll be sort of seeing uh, an EIA approval um, in in coming months, that'll be sort of a you know a very sort of key uh, key milestone. Uh, the outcomes of the EIA will then sort of be fed into the DFS, and we'd like to be um, sort of moving forward to the sort of conclusion of the DFS um, by the uh, by the end of the year. Um, you know, we'll be looking at um, probably uh, the award of exploration licenses in um, in Portugal later this this year. We'll be um, looking to participate in the. Uh, lithium tender uh, that's going to be um, issued by the um, by the sort of the Portuguese uh, Portuguese government, and there will probably uh, be news around um, sort of further um, offtake agreements as well. So we'll be sort of filling out our um, sales book and um, hopefully not to, not selling more than what we will be able to produce. So news filled. Okay. In terms of the EIA, um, we've had uh, several questions about. The negative press you've been receiving in Portugal, you know, you know there's, there's been some opposition to environmental aspects of the project. Uh, it was on the SAV uh, bulletin board on London South East uh, yesterday. Is this something which might get in the way of the, the EIA, do you think? Is this something you're concerned about? Um, well, you know, I think there'll be uh, opposition to, you know, virtually anything you want to do, whether you want to make uh, renovate your house, um, the neighbours will uh, no doubt complain. Um, whether it's a shopping centre or a mine, um, so yeah, we're hardly sort of surprised. I think I think the key thing is that um, it really has to all be seen in, in sort of context. We see um, the opposition really uh, coming from a, a small activist cell. Um, we contrast that with you know literally the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of. Um, uh, job applications that are sort of pouring in and when you think that you know there'll be 200 people um, directly employed in our mine um, um, assuming each one of those persons um, has um, say three family members um, yeah that's that's um, three times 200 that's um, 600 that's 600 people um, you know who, who might be sort of benefiting from it so um, and that's, you know, without the indirect jobs as well. I mean, it's going to be, you know, just uh, transformational uh, for this um, for this region. It'll provide a lot of opportunity. Um, we'll be, and we've got a, a benefit sharing plan that we'll be endowing with half a million euros per annum. A lot of that money will go directly into the community. And, um, you know, we, we feel that we've sort of presented you know, highly sort of professional um, uh, environmental impact um, uh, document and I'd encourage um, anyone who's concerned uh, to just read the document and you can sort of see that you know we've designed something that is responsible, sustainable and um, you know we're sort of really looking to do that 
the, the, the right thing by the local community and um, and future generations. Apart from sort of producing lithium that um, you know will help really um, you know the, the globe sort of deal with um, uh, global warming and and indeed um, air quality in uh, towns and cities. Uh, people do forget that um, electric vehicles don't belch out particulates and. Um, if anyone's got uh, young children, I think that's the last thing they want is uh, sort of diesel particulates um, being sort of generated in um, in their streets outside their bedroom windows. Okay, we've had lots of questions uh, flooding in for you. Uh, Antonio uh, Mural, apologies if I've got your name wrong, I would like to ask uh, you if it'll be possible to have new mining projects without the rest of the value chain added. He's basically saying, will, will the value adds uh, projects end up in Portugal? Will it end up in Germany, as you were mentioning? Uh, if you could discuss that and put a little bit of uh, context in there for Antonio, please. Sure. Well, you know, I think uh, the fact that um, we've got um, you know, Europe's largest uh, and most significant spodumene lithium resource, you know, probably means that um, um, Portugal would be a pretty sensible place to uh, build a conversion plant uh, to sort of convert the material into uh, into hydroxide. So I think there's a terrific opportunity for uh, Portugal to, you know, be an early mover um, in um, the development of the sort of the the, the, the um, sort of top end of the value chain in um, in Portugal, so a great opportunity. Um, certainly, there are other um, proposed uh, developments in uh, in Europe. Uh, you know, we're certainly aware of one in uh, in Germany, another one in Poland, uh, one in uh, in Finland, and um, you know, really, spodumene lithium will be you know the, the core sort of centerpiece uh, to, for to supply. Europe's lithium requirement because um, spodumene lithium is the, the most internationally um, sort of traded uh, lithium raw material. So um, Europe's requirement will not be able to be sort of satisfied by indigenous production. Material will have to come in from West Africa, Brazil, Canada, Australia. So um, yeah, but spodumene lithium <coughs> will be will be the key mineral. What about, uh, Alex Reese asked, what about uh, uh, plans for possible future expansion of the business if the EV thematic plays out as hoped? There's a positive question for you. Yeah, no, I think I think um, I think it's um, spot on. I think there's some great opportunities. Um, uh, Portugal remains highly prospective. I believe that there are multiple uh, Mina de Brossos um, yet to be found uh, by the um, by the exploration community. So, you know, I think Portugal can very much become uh, Europe's uh, sort of conventional raw material hub. Um, I think Spain also has uh, has its own potential. So, um, you know, certainly the, the Portuguese government and Spanish government uh, are very alive to the opportunity, and um, you know, they remain they remain highly supportive of um, um, the development of the industry. You know, um, and um, you know, that will be. Uh, sort of galvanized by um, domestic production in those two two countries. Okay, Phil Pinto and one other ask uh, similar questions about the share price. Uh, the both shareholders, the concerns of share prices below the recent placing and dropping each day, um, discuss, you know, what are the near term catalysts to improve, says Phil. Well, so clearly the um, EIA award. I think that would um, I think that would um, be um, um, be um, very welcomed. I think, and um, I think that'd be reflected in the um, in in the sort of share price. Um, I think uh, sort of further offtakes. I think will sort of only sort of highlight um, the strategic importance of the uh, of sort of the resource. I think that would be sort of value adding. Um, so I think there's sort of probably the sort of the, the two key sort of um, very near term catalysts. Great, and that was a nice short answer. Well done. One last question. Um, this is the second time we've had you on here. We're delighted to ha have you back. We've never discussed Mozambique. Um, mm -hmm. You've got uh, a major project at the Mutamba Heavy Mineral Sands uh, project in Mozambique, um, uh, being uh, developed with Rio Tinto. Where, where is that? Give us a, a, a brief summary of, of that. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, it's certainly one of the, the largest undeveloped uh, mineral sands deposits in, in the world. Good news is that uh, mineral sands prices uh, are, are actually uh, are increasing at the moment. Um, we've got a, uh, a joint venture with a, a global major. I don't think it's uh, probably getting um, as much love in our share prices as it probably uh, probably deserves. 
So, you know, we're certainly looking at, you know, what we uh, can do to um, effectively um, sort of separate it from the, uh, from the mothership and, um, and um, sort of highlight the value um, in, in, in that way. Is, is the project uh, actually currently being developed or what's the state of play? Yeah, so we've, uh, we're doing a pre-feasibility study um, at the moment. Um, so we're sort of looking, we're you know, particularly sort of focused on some of the sort of baseline environmental studies that uh, are required um, around that. Uh, we're doing some you know, sort of further um, financial analysis and um, we're sort of looking at a, you know, a series of uh, development options um, around that. So um, you know, work is actively uh, underway at the moment. But you know, what we really want to do is sort of very much sort of focus on, on lithium and, um, and, and our European assets. We think it's a little bit sort of confusing to have um, uh, sort of a, a focus on Europe um, plus, plus something in uh, Southern Africa. Okay, David Archer, it's been fantastic to have you back. Thank you so much. Um, Kavanka Resources are our final company of the evening. They're an, a CAV, an exploration company, expl uh, targeting the discovery of world-class mineral deposits in Botswana, specifically in the Kalahari Suture Zone and the Kalahari Copper Belt. Um, in the KSV, Kavango, Kavango is proving the use of sophisticated remote sensing technologies and data modeling of the findings to identify drill targets for metal sulfides. And in the Kalahari Copper Belt, Kavango is targeting large scale copper silver deposits and working in two separate joint ventures, firstly with Power Metal Resources who you may remember featured in our November the 3rd uh, webinar last year. Very interesting uh, they were too. If you'd like to research them, uh, there you go. And secondly, they're JVing with LVR Geo Explorers. Ben Tarney, Executive Director at Kavango, is making the investment case for the company tonight. Over to you, Ben. Great, thank you, Donald. Thank you very much. So if I share my screen. This evening, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk you through um, the the case for Kavango as a stock to, to be in your portfolio. We've obviously given a lot of um, promotion recently. We've done a lot of other presentations. I've gone into a lot of detail about the technical aspects of the project, but tonight I want to focus on some of the more practical aspects of buying into a company like ours. Explain a bit about the rationale as to why I joined the board back in January and what really attracted me to working with this company over several others as a genuine exploration firm with the opportunity to deliver potentially life-changing returns for our shareholders. So we have the usual disclaimer here. Um, I have to leave that up on screen for a moment so that people can digest this. Um, we've also got to be very careful about uh, financial promotion rules and what have you. But I want to give you as honest a view as I can. Um, as a, a retail investor myself, this is my background. I've been active in this market now for 12 years. And walk you through four of the key areas that I always use to try and judge a company. Now, I've had a few um, disasters in my career. Some of those have been quite highly uh, publicized. Some investments I've made have not gone so well, but others, thankfully, have gone extremely well. And we started off this evening with uh, Touchstone Resources, Touchstone Exploration, sorry, I should say, which is one of the, the companies that I backed back in 2017. And the, the, the job that Paul and his team have done there has been absolutely phenomenal. So it was fantastic to, to listen to him earlier. And I think they really exemplify what I feel is the, the best of this market and what can really be achieved when you have a management team that's working genuinely to deliver a world class project. So the screen that we have up in front of us is um, sort of an outline of the four areas that, that I'll typically use when I'm looking at a, at a company deciding whether or not to put my money into it. So resources investing in the small cap space, it's a pretty brutal environment to work in. As investors, you know, we have to be very careful. We have to be very alive to, frankly, the lies that can be told to us by many companies and by many directors as they try and convince us to part with our money. But in broad terms, I think there are four areas that, that we can look at in a business that even with publicly available information and all of the pitfalls there can often be about what a company has actually presented to the, the public. But there are four key areas that once we've really got to the bottom of as a, as, an, as a private investor, and once we've satisfied ourselves that what has been told to us is honest, is truthful, is a genuine representation of the business that we're thinking about putting our money into, if we can tick off all four of these areas, then we've identified a stock that really is worth buying and holding. So this evening, what I'd like to do is make exactly this pitch to you as the director of Kavango Resources. So the first area that I always look at at the beginning is management alignment. Now, no matter what any director ever tells you, 
they, their interests will never truly be aligned with yours. Even sitting here in front of you this evening, I'm now a director and an officer of Cavango Resources. I'm quite a significant shareholder. I put quite a lot of money into this business personally before I joined the board as disclosed as part of the disclosure when, when I joined the company. But sitting to you this evening, I'm not an investor in Cavango anymore. I'm a director of the company and that's quite a crucial difference. So as much as our board at Cavango has significant skin in the game, we don't face the same sort of choices that you do as an investor in our company. But even so, there are still a number of things that you can look for just to see the extent to which our interests are aligned with yours. Now, this might seem a little bit backwards in terms of thinking, because I think a lot of retail investors, they look at the projects first. But I put that as the second item this evening to, to look at when assessing a company, because, of course, the projects matter. You have to look at the overall project quality. But unfortunately, as we all know, the disclosure requirements you know, on the stock exchange, they can sometimes leave a few holes in them. So what we think we're investing in or planning to put our money into, the actual evidence and the actual facts underlying that or supporting the value case, they can sometimes be somewhat missing, let's say, putting it kindly. Next, and what's obviously extremely important with all of these businesses is company financing. Now, we all know that placings, more often than not, they're done at discounts and heavily discounted placings. Those can be death to a, a share price and the traction that that can gain in the market. It's always vitally important to get an idea of what a company's cash burn is how much, how much cash that company has, how much working capital it has access to, and can it fund its uh, working, its work program commitments over the following 12 to 18 months. And as I'm about to present to you at Cavango, I believe we're in an extremely strong position. And finally, and I think this is something that's often overlooked, is the consistency of the narrative. Now, when you go back and you look through a company's um, announcements, it's always good to look back over three or four years see what that company promised, see what they said they would do, and then match that up against what the company actually did. If you find there are any major discrepancies, that's usually an obvious red flag. But what I hope to show you today is how Cavango, while it's certainly made a number of mistakes over the years, and we have, and some of them have been quite costly, overall, what we have achieved, we've um, we've said we, we've, we've done what we said we would do, we've achieved what we've set out to do, um, albeit there have been times when the plan has needed to change, as often happens in resource exploration. But I really do feel that we as a business are one of the most honest exploration companies out in the market. So the slide that I have in front of you now, um, I just have to minimise this, is the, um, the, the current share structure. So I talked a little bit earlier on about management alignment. Now, normally a lot of um, if there are other management teams, I'd like to highlight this figure, which I'm highlighting on the slide here, which shows that the manager, the current directors, senior management and founders of the company hold 25%. But what I'd actually like to draw your attention to is this bit of information here. Our current board cost at Cavango is £160,000 a year. So that's for our entire board of directors. So for if I look at like other companies that are out there, that can be the cost of the CEO in many cases. At Cavango, we have a philosophy where our commitment is to put as many pounds into the ground, exploration pounds into the ground as we possibly can. So we run an extremely tight ship. Our, um, our operating overhead, our PLC overhead is about 430,000 pounds a year in total, which compares extremely favorably pretty much to all of our peers. We, our commitment to using your money to put it into exploration is very sincere. Now, of course, we do have this 25% figure that I'm highlighting now. You know, We do have a lot of skin in the game. This is obviously after a number of rounds of financing as well. So our board of directors, they have participated in the fundraisings that there have been, they've maintained their stakes. And as a result of that, our management interests are to see Cavan go through to making major, and we're hoping to make a number of these, major discoveries uh, of, of metal deposits in Botswana, which is our main area of operation. Now, our first project, moving on to the second area, of course, is project quality. So our flagship project, as many people will know, is the Kalahari Suture Zone. There's a lot of information we put out in the public domain. Um, our provide a, prov a brief, inf um, brief overview now. But the KSZ is a 450 kilometer long magnetic anomaly in the southwest corner of Botswana. 
It was first identified in the 1970s by airborne surveys that were flown by a um, Canadian aid program that flew extensive airborne surveys over Botswana with the aim of helping you know, the Botswana mining industry develop to help the, company, the country's economy grow. Now, when the KSZ was first identified, there was a huge amount of excitement about it. The, 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 the geology itself lies underneath about 70 metres of Kalahari cover, which means that all of the, the regional geolo geology is, is obscured from view. So this meant historic exploration was pretty much zero because obviously no one could see what was underneath the sands. So when the airborne surveys were flown in the 1970s and they identified this 450 kilometre long anomaly, it immediately um, caused a lot of excitement because of the analog with the Norilsk mining center in northern Russia. Now Norilsk was originally discovered back in the 1920s and production began there and even today after 100 years of nearly continuous production it's still one of the world's major sources for copper, nickel and platinum group elements. So when the KSZ was first identified and it was shown it had a very similar um, magnetic profile to Norilsk, it was also the a geological position of this project that really caught people's attention. So in the middle part of this slide, you can see that the KSZ sits just on the western edge of the Kapval Kraton in southwest Botswana, very simple, similar to um, the, the Rilsk sensor, which sits on the western edge of the Siberian Kraton in northern Russia. Now, the significance of that is that as Kratons moved through tectonic activity over millions of years, where the tectonic plates moved apart, this caused obviously areas of significant volcanic activity. And it was those periods of prolonged volcanic activity that brought to surface a lot of what we now use as the world's, meta, the world's major metal deposits. So to have discovered this frankly virgin territory um, at this time in the 70s, it, it did attract a lot of interest. The problem that companies faced back then and a number of businesses like Falcon Bridge and other major Canadian firms who explored the KSZ previously, the problem that they faced was that te technology at the time wasn't sophisticated enough to enable them to penetrate through the Kalahari cover, through those 70 metres of sands, to get a, a clear idea of the underground geology to identify clearly de delineated drill targets. So we felt uh, when we first set the company up, or when our founders first set it up back in 2012, that was the opportunity now. Technology had, had advanced to such a point that they felt these new modern methods could be deployed in the Kalahari Suture Zone and used obviously to find what we hope will be major metal ore bodies. Now what we're looking at on this screen um, is a slide that I've presented recently. And it highlights uh, one of the limitations of the old airborne technology that was first used to identify the Kalahari Suture Zone. So what you're looking at is um, a top-down view of the AEM surveys originally flown. And what we can see here, just in this area that I'm highlighting uh, with my cursor, is hole CKP8. Now this was drilled back in about 1985-86 by a Canadian company and it was the deepest hole that was ever drilled in the Kalahari Suture Zone, down to about 450 metres, but it was abandoned. It was abandoned because the drilling company at the time didn't encounter any metal sulphides and so therefore they got to 450 metres and they felt that it was a dud hole. Our view is that actually they made a mistake and what they should have done at the time is focused on this magnetic an anomaly um, which is over to the west. And what I'm now going to show you on the next slide, or sorry, the one after, is the results of our TDEM surveys. Now, um, what we can see here very, very clearly is the magnetic anomaly that the Canadians originally made, made their original uh, drill, um, drill target decision on was based on the Proterozoic Gabbro, which lies about 900 metres below the Karoo Age Gabbro um, on top. Now, the Proterozoic Gabbros were, from, were formed originally about 1.1 billion years ago um, during that period of prolonged volcanic activity. Now, when looking at the airborne survey back on this slide, the airborne magnetics, because it's quite a blunt instrument, it picked up what is also a very heavily magnetic conductive body. So this area here, which you can see, um, which is what the Canadians decided to drill, slap bang in the middle of, coincides pretty much exactly with this magnetic body that we're looking here at a depth of about 900 meters. Now, even with modern mining techniques and modern exploration technology, realistically to open up a new mining frontier, these targets are far too deep. 
So what we've created using TDEM technology and using modern, sorry, using modern airborne um, technology, we've created a, an underground 3D model that's distinguished and differentiated between the Karoo age gabbros, which are about 180 million years old, and those much deeper, much older Proterozoic gabbros, which are about 1.1 billion. And what you're looking at now um, is the result of this work. So we flew these surveys in, air, air, these airborne surveys in 2019. They covered the entire northern section of the Kalahari Suture Zone. And from the data that we gathered from this quite extensive survey that we flew, we processed internally using our own methods that our own in-house team has, has developed, but also worked very closely with a company called Miro Geoscience based down in Australia. Now in partnership with Miro, the map that we created when we first got the results, it was just incredibly exciting. Because as you can see here, very clearly, we have these characteristic Norilsk style keel and gull wing formations. Now what's significant about that is that these formations mirror almost identically the Norilsk, um, the Norilsk deposits that are even today, some of the world's richest deposits of um, nickel, and copper and platinum group metals. So we've written a lot about this in our RNSs, but this image in particular is very powerful because what we're looking at is target area A in this area of the TDEM surveys that we subsequently um, performed and I'm about to show you some results of. Now, what you can see on this image um, is, if you look here, you see this vertical red line, you can see hole CKP8. It penetrated through the gabbro and was obviously then abandoned. But this area here is where we've discovered um, this target A2 that I'm about to show the results of. So jumping ahead to back to this slide, the first survey that we ran was target area A1. And the reason that we picked this area was simply because this historic hole had been drilled here, which we've used the data from to learn a lot about the potential of the, um, the, the Kalahari suture zone to host magmatic sulfide ore bodies. So the drill core that we've, we've we recovered from the warehouses in Kang, we've analyzed, we've had a number of world-renowned ex experts go and um, perform various types of analysis on, on, the, on the drill cores, and they've identified what are called primary sulfides. Now, the primary sulfides are extremely important because, we, because we've identified that these, four, these primary sulfides actually formed, what that's told tells us about the system as a whole, the Karoo age gabbro system, is that this actually is conducive to holding metallic ore bodies somewhere within, we hope, our, our target, our, our license areas. So the, the first TDEM survey that we ran was over this area, and you can see an outline here of the one kilometer squared copper wire that was run out to conduct the survey. Now we have other material that we published on our website that shows how the TDEM surveys work. So I won't go into too much detail about that now, but what you can actually see here is that the first TDEM survey returned nothing in terms of um, an, an interesting conductive hit. Instead, all we confirmed was the existence of the Proterozoic Gabbro at a much deeper level. However, when we moved on to the second TDEM survey, Area A2, things became a lot more exciting for us a lot, you know, extremely quickly, because what we immediately identified was target A2, which we've written about um, in RNSs that we've published. Now, what you're looking at here, this red zone, this is the conductive target. It's one kilometer long. It's giving off a reading of 3000 Siemens, which is extremely significant because they're reading anything above a thousand Siemens suggests it could be a metal ore body. So we're looking forward to drilling this target later on this year. But what we're particularly encouraged by is the position of this, this target relative to the Karoo age Gabbro. So our key target area, if I jump back to our 3D model, is we're looking for the formation of potential metallic sulfide, metal sulfide ore bodies in the walls and at the bottom of these keel formations. This is exactly the type of formation that exists in Norilsk. These are the, the formations that have been mined for a very long time and have obviously yielded such incredible volumes of, of nickel, copper and platinum group metal, metals. And what we're looking at with this target A2 is a highly conductive target in exactly the right uh, geological setting that our model predicted with exactly the right, what we hope is exactly the right conductive reading coming off. So if I now move on to the Kalahari Copper Belt, 
this is an area that is um, a project area of ours that is sometimes often overlooked. There's a lot of investor interest in the Kalahari Suture Zone. But one of the things that sets Kavango apart from many other exploration companies at this, this end of the market is we have two genuinely world-class projects. The potential in the KSZ, in the Kalahari Suture Zone, is pure blue sky. We're looking to open up there a new mining district that if we're right and if we're able to discover these, these uh, nickel sulfide or copper sulfide ore bodies, the, the, the returns will just be staggering. But in the copper belt, we've used our in-country exploration team to secure two joint ventures with a local company, LVR Resource, LVR Geo Resources, and with Power Metal Resources that's listed um, on, on AIM. Now, over the last um, three months, we've made a lot of progress in the Kalahari copper belt. And we released an update uh, just over uh, 10 days ago where we provided our first uh, results from the airborne surveys that we flew um, over the copper belt and what i'm going to show you here this is the first image that we've released of this um, but this information is all in the public domain if you refer back to the uh, recent south garnsey updates we described in detail um, about targets acacia and marula what this image here shows is a visual depiction of the results that we, we already published. But what I'd like to do today is just draw your attention to some of the, the key points about why we're so excited about these targets in particular and why we think we could be looking at something really quite exciting in this project area. So when we first secured the South Guernsey project um, license areas, what attracted us most was if you follow the mouse cursor down this part of the screen, you can see a slight discoloration to the south of it. This area here is what's known as a fold nose, a plunging fold nose. So imagine the Earth's surface as it's moved over millions of years and the Earth has pushed underneath sort of this section of this upper section of Earth at the top here. Now, across the Kalahari copper belt, there have been a number of major discoveries, major copper discoveries. And this fold nose that we described in the RNS this type of formation has yielded some of the best, such as, for example, the T3 discovery that was originally made by Mod Resources and Metal Tiger about five years ago. Now, so we were already attracted by the area, so we then flew uh, airborne surveys over this region. And what we immediately identified were two, in this particular segment of South Guernsey, two very large conductive targets um, that aligned pretty much exactly with the geological model that was the original reason that we bought into, or we, we applied for these licenses. Now, the main conductor that we identified actually crosses over into Sandfire's ground. So the license immediately to the north of uh, South Guernsey is, is owned by Sandfire. And as you can see, it crosses over into the border. But what we've done since is we've conducted some fairly extensive soil sample testing across these two targets. Now, what's particularly interesting about this is that you'll note that the soil sample readings that we're displaying here, these are the copper readings. It's not zinc that we're looking at. Zinc is often used as a pathfinder element for some of the copper um, discoveries that there have been in the Kalahari um, copper belt, uh, because zinc is a much more mobile element within the Earth's surface. Um, so therefore, if the zinc is present, it's used as an indicator of other metals that might also be present and has been used to deline delineate uh, drill targets. What's very significant for us about what we're looking at on this image here is that these are copper readings. Now, copper is a much less mobile element than zinc, but for us to have, and, we, and it's also traveled through about 20 meters of Kalahari cover. So it's not even that the targets themselves are at surface here, the copper has actually traveled through this 20 meters of sand cover to reach surface. And what we're particularly encouraged by is that the copper um, anomalies align almost identically with the airborne surveys that we flew over the major targets. Now, it's far too early for us to start talking here about this being an economic discovery, but what we can say with a lot of confidence in that this section of the um, South Guernsey project, we are looking at a copper mineralized system. Now, we obviously have to go out and drill this, um, drill these targets. We have to get the truth detector out. We have to, to, to see both the, the grades of the copper that's present and also the volume of the copper that's present. But the targets themselves are between 120 to 200 meters depth. So if they do turn out to be economic, then we'd be looking at similar open pit style operations that have been further, have been um, created further up to the northeast of the of the uh, geological trends that, that we're working on in this area of, of the copper belt. 
So very quickly, company funding. Uh, we've got working capital of about 1.7 million. Uh, we've pursued an extremely innovative um, funding strategy for the business. We're very well financed. We've got no immediate need to place. We have a warrant bank of four and a half million pounds that's all currently in the money. Um, we've been very careful about our joint venture partners. Um, so the partnership with Power Metal Resources has enabled us to accelerate uh, progress in the Kalahari Copper Belt, while the partnership that we recently confirmed with Spectral Geoscience, that's enabled us to conduct much more extensive and more powerful surveys in the KSZ. We're in talks at the moment with a drilling company. Our, our hope is that we'll have something to announce there, hopefully in the near future. And finally, there's the Kenya Resources spin out. So our goal there is to is to spin Kenya Resources out so that it becomes an asset on the company's balance sheet. It would have been good to have explained that in a bit more time. So hopefully someone will have a question for me about that. And then finally, consistency of narrative. Um, if you look back through Kavango's history, um, you look at what the company's achieved in the three years that it's been listed. Um, the company's pretty much done everything that it had set out to set out to achieve. The, the airborne surveys back in 2018, they didn't work in the KSZ, but we learned from those mistakes that we made and the surveys that we then ran in 2019 enabled us to create the 3D model that's now such an integral part of our exploration strategy moving forward. So finally, um, the case for Kavango, management alignment, um, we hold 25% of the, 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 um, of the company, that's after a number of financings. We've got extremely low PLC overheads with 160,000 pounds worth of, our direct remuneration is 160,000 pounds. We have genuine world-class projects. Everything that we've put out into the domain is backed by robust science, the methods that we've used. We're using extremely innovative technology to, to help us um, define our drill target targets, which is why we have so much confidence in them. Company funding, we've got, we're fully funded through our work program in 2021 and into 2022 with a great deal of shareholder support. And finally, consistency of narrative. We're a business that's done everything that we said we would set out to do. So when we say that we're going to drill this year with high impact drill targets, it's because we're going to drill this year with high impact drill targets. Let's ask you the tricky questions first. Mohammed Abdurman. Uh, oh, here we go. Kavanga Resources has never previously had any success despite multiple explorations. What gives you the high level of confidence that Kavanga Resources will be successful with world class mineral deposits in the future? OK, actually, that that question is wrong because Kavango has had a great deal of success um, on the ground. What Kavango you, has you tell them. <laughs> yeah, what, what Kavango hasn't been so successful at in the past is um, explaining how well it's done. So. If you look at the four holes that were drilled in 2019, um, the company's objective with that, it had fairly limited funds at the time, so it could only um, afford to drill relatively shallow holes. The targets for mineralization that we're looking at are between sort of four to 500 meters, but the, the drill campaign in 2019, the aim was to intercept the thinner gabbros and not only break through them at the top, but also break through them at the bottom. Now, the reason that, that was important is because with any geophysical model that you create, you have to back it up with actual drill data. So by testing the thickness of the gabbros, what we were actually able to do was validate that our geophysical model that we've created, um, it gave us a lot more confidence that that worked. So um, I, I think it's, it is, it's definitely wrong to say there hasn't been success. Um, obviously, the companies work with limited resources. Um, and we've also had to address, you know, this, this major challenge of, of identifying the, the, the key drill targets to, to go and look for mineralization, which is what we're now looking to achieve with the TDEM surveys, um, which, we, which we've deployed this year. So um, definitely understand the question. I see the point. Perhaps things have taken too long, but you also need to think about market conditions over the last few years. It's been a very difficult market to, 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 to deliver a, a blue sky project like this. But with where we are now today, with the funding we have, with everything we've learned about the KSZ and the KCB, we really do feel that we're set up for success. Very good. OK, Adam Everett asks, how long does drill permitting typically take in the Kalahari Suture Zone? And based on this, when will CAV start to drill the KSZ targets recently identified? So it, it typically takes about three to four months, um, but we already have the permits in place in, this, in the Kalahari Suture Zone. 
What we're actually waiting on are the drill permits in the Kalahari copper belt. Now, the reason that we're waiting at the moment is that we have, as I mentioned in the presentation, we're in fairly advanced talks with a, a drilling contractor who we think we're gonna um, get into a, a strategic relationship with. And um, at this point, we've obviously got, you know, a limited amount of money um, that we're working with. So the reason we're not drilling just yet is we're waiting until we get the permits issued to us in the KCB. Then once we have that, our plan is to go out and use the same drill rig to drill the KSZ and then immediately follow that up with the KCB. What that will save the company is two sets of uh, mobilization costs, which is a fairly significant cost saving. Um, so at this point, it means we just have to be a little patient for about another six weeks. Okay, David Gordon asks, uh, other than Sandfire and Cooperick Canyon Capital, are there any other top 20 majors currently reviewing acreage in the, in the Kalahari Copper Belt? And have any of them approached you to take a stake in your Kalahari licenses? Honest answer is I've got no idea what any majors are looking at in the Copper Belt. Um, I mean, sort of how, how could I know? In terms of um, approaches to us, we're still a bit early stage. Um, until we've actually been able to um, prove any economic um, copper in particular in the, in the Copper Belt, it would be premature for us to have those sorts of discussions. Um, but obviously, you know, if we do uh, manage to make a hit, the fact that we're with the um, Power Metals uh, JV, we're, we're neighbouring Sandfire, we're in the right geological postcode, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't expect that it would take too long before we started to have some people knocking on our door. Uh, David Gordon also asks, which kind of takes us into that, that power metal area, has the opportunity for AIM Juniors to hold cross interests in each other's Kalahari acreage been considered as a way to hedge risk in case you don't find commercially viable deposits in your own projects? Well, I mean, that, that's exactly what we've done with the with the Power Metals joint venture. I, I imagine the questions may be asking about some of the oper other operators that are in this space. Other operators, indeed. Yeah, I, I mean, look, you could potentially get everybody all to work together, but this is obviously a competitive market space. I mean, one of the things about our company is we're very confident in our, our technical team and our reading of the regional geology. And we see particular opportunity in the western half of the Copper Belt in, in Botswana that we feel is underexplored. So we think that gives Gives us quite a quite a significant competitive advantage at this stage which we believe has been demonstrated by the um, success that it looks like we've 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 achieved um, uh, in the South Guernsey project. Okay um, do you believe the potential rewards of the KSZ compared to Wazi Bay? Um, oh, I don't have a name and, mm -hmm. uh, and or do you think current shareholders could expect to see similar rate of returns if CAV are successful in the KSZ? So this year in the KSZ is all about proof of concept. Um, at the moment, we've, we've gathered a lot of circumstantial evidence that this is a system that hosts magmatic sulfide ore bodies. Um, the $64,000 question is being able to identify those ore bodies. Um, we're, we're very, I don't know if confident is the right word, but we're very encouraged by what we've identified at A2. We're really looking forward to drilling this. But the main objective in the first uh, drill holes that we put into the KSZ will be to get to the bottom of those keel formations that I showed in the uh, in the presentation. It's uh, no one's ever achieved this in the KSZ, but what we really need to do is get drill core from the bottom of those to so that we can then obviously send that off to the various experts that we're working with to prove up the system's potential. If on the way to the bottom of the keels we're able to intercept. Um, obviously metal sulfide um, bodies then you know fantastic and the upside even with a 16 million pound market cap at this level the upside could be absolutely incredible. Uh, final question uh, from Fraser Wood regarding target A2 and the promising conductive readings of over 3,000 Siemens uh, what are the false positives for this type of reading and how can we be sure this is a metal ore body? Well, it's, it's a really, really good question. I mean, look, the, the only way we can ever be sure is by getting the truth detector out, which of course is the drill bit, and go and drill it and see what's actually down there. In terms of everything that we've done to try and de-risk um, the, the, the target, we've obviously sent it off to, the, the data that we've gathered, we've sent off to a number, of, um, a number of experts around the world. We believe we've already ruled out um, a, an aquifer so that we think we've ruled out a saline water body. That's one of the big risks in the KSZ which historic exploration has encountered. There are quite large um, 
under underground saline water bodies which can give off these false positive readings but with a with a 3000 siemens conductance reading there are only so many things that this could be um, whether or not it turns out to be a metal ore body that's the first question whether or not it then turns out to be an economic metal ore body that's then that's obviously the big question that we'll seek to address by going out and drilling later this year ben Tony, uh, we've come to the end of our fascinating evening thank you so much for your time